Hi, welcome to Discussion Line Walkthrough video. We're going to be covering trees, graphs, and heaps today. For some announcements, homework two is due March 15th, as is the mid-semester survey, and that's worth some extra credit, so make sure you do it. There is no lab this week in light of the midterm, and uh, hopefully you know this, but the midterm is happening on Wednesday, March 17th, from 7.10 to 9 p.m. So I know midterms are inherently pretty stressful, but just make sure to relax, drink water, get sleep, and know that you're doing your best, and that is enough. With that being said, we can actually just move on to some of the content review. So first things first, we're going to talk about trees. Um, we've already sort of seen trees, right? We've seen binary search trees, left leaning red black trees, and two three trees. And hopefully, um, we're maybe picking up on some patterns, right? That at their heart, trees are just structures um, that follow a few basic rules. And so they have n nodes and n minus one edges. So for example, here we have five nodes and uh, four edges, so five nodes, five minus one edges. Um, and there is exactly one path from every node to every other node. So what this means is if I want to get from node, let's say, A to node B, there's only one way to get there, traversing those edges. If there was a cycle, for example, this would not be a tree. Or in other words, if there was another way to get from A to B, this would not be a tree. Finally, um, the above two rules together mean that trees are fully connected and contain no cycles. So just as I was saying, um, to get from A to B, if there was another path, that would create a cycle. And so that's not allowed, which means trees have no cycles. And fully connectedness just means that I can get from A to any other node. In a tree, there would be no such node C where I could not get to C from A. There's no nodes that are like isolated or on their own little island in trees. And so these are our fundamental rules for trees and some vocab. A parent node points toward, toward its child. So here, for example, um, if this node was C, C is the parent and A is the child. The root of a tree is a node with no parent nodes. So in this example, C is the root. And a leaf of a tree is a node with no child nodes. So in this example, B is a leaf. And that's our vocab for trees. So graphs um, are super similar to what we know about trees, but they are a little more general. Graphs allow cycles, unlike trees. And so for example, while a tree is a graph, for example, this tree is a valid graph, graphs also allow cycles. So this is a valid graph, even though it's not a valid tree. Um, another thing is that simple graphs don't allow parallel edges, which means two or more edges connecting the same two nodes, or self edges, which means an edge from the vertex to itself. The last thing is that um, in general, when we're talking about graphs, um, whether it's a graph that looks like a tree or not, they may be directed or undirected. And so for example, um, in this case, let's say this is a node A to B, this edge is an arrow pointing from A to B which means we can think of it as an edge that can only be crossed in the AB direction. On the other hand, in this undirected graph, where the edges just look like lines and not arrows, we can say that you can cross this edge either going from B to A or A to B. And so it's undirected. And these are the distinctions we make when talking about graphs. Um, and so just a reminder that trees technically are a type of graph. For example, this tree, is a valid graph, but not all graphs are trees, as you can see here. Lastly, this graph is not a simple graph, which means it's not in scope for this class. In our class, we'll only be talking about graphs that don't have parallel edges and don't have, have self edges. Cool. So breadth for a search is something we can apply to both graphs and trees. For trees, that means we're basically looking through the tree level by level. But in general, we can think of breadth first search as visiting nodes based off their distance from the source. Um, and so maybe it's more precise to say source here. And so um, specifically, let's say we're taking A as our source or our starting point. Breadth first search allows us to start here and then traverse the whole tree, or in other words, look through it. And this might help us find out, for example, if um, like a path from A to a different node. And so 
breadth per search is super handy and comes up a lot. In this example, breadth per search would take us level by level, as it always does, which means we'd go to A first, then we'd go to the next level in our tree. So we'd look at B and C. Then we'd look at the next level and look at D and E. Another way to think about this is that A is zero nodes away from the source or starting point because A is our starting point. B and C are one edge away from our starting point. And so we visit the things with distance one next. And lastly, we visit the things that are two edges away from the start because to get from A to D, you'd have to take two edges and similarly with E. And so that is how um, we do breadth for search. In reality, we often implement this using a queue. And so if we think about this, we can imagine we have some sort of queue where we look at the nodes in um, the order we want to see them. And so for example, we start with our source and so we put A onto the queue. Then because A's are first in, first out, we shove A through the queue and it comes out on the other side. We pop it off, which means we go look at A or explore A. While looking at A, we see, oh, A has these children, B and C. And so we might put B next on the queue and C next on the queue. And A has been popped off over here. Cool. Well then, when we're looking at B, so we'd pop B off the queue because again, first in, first out. So B gets popped off, C marches forward in line. And now we're looking at B closer and we realize, hey, B has some children too. Specifically, B has these children, D and E. And so now that we're looking here, we're gonna wanna go ahead and add B's children to the queue. And so we'd add D and E next. But here's the important thing to remember. Because queues are first in, first out, we are going to visit C before we visit D and E because C was put on the queue first. C is ahead in line of D and E. So we're going to look at C next. And this is what brings us that level order. We visit all the things here before we move on to this next level. And so this is why BFS is really handy for scenarios when that's the behavior we want. So we'd pop C off the queue because it's next. And then we'd say, okay, C has no children. I'm looking at it. So we can just move on. And then we'd pop D and then E and we get this order. So that's breadth first search. This stands in opposition to depth first search. And so in depth first search, instead of visiting um, all the things on the same level first, we sort of um, dig recursively. And so what that means is that if we started looking here and we started looking at B next, for example, in pre-order depth first search, we'd visit B and then go, okay, I'm gonna go visit my children now before we ever got to E. And so the idea here is that we care about digging deeper before we look um, like broader, if that makes sense. So we dig deeper through our tree or graph or whatever it is, and then come back to where we were and go, okay, where was I? Let me keep looking there. And so um, there's a couple different ways we can do depth first search. Pre-order means that we visit a parent node before officially saying we visited the child nodes. So for example, here we visit A, and we look, we add it to the queue, or we say we visited, sorry. And then we go look at its left child, for example, B. And then instead of visiting E next, we go visit C. Because as I said earlier, the point of depth for search is that we care about digging deeper before we go fill out um, all of our like width or breadth. And so we'd visit C and then we'd visit D. Then finally, we'd come back up to where we were and go, okay, um, we visit all of these children and we've not finished visiting A, so let's go do that. And we visit E. And so we get the order A, B, C, D, E. Then we have in order traversals. And so in in order, in order traversals, we're gonna visit the left child, then we'll visit the parent, then we'll visit the right child. And so I'll take you with, through that what that means. So we start here and rather than officially visiting D, we say, okay, let me go visit my left child. So we go looking there. And then we say, okay, before I visit me, let me go visit my left child. So we go there. And then we say, okay, before we visit me, let me visit my left, left child. Oh wait, that's null. So now we can visit me. And so we visit A, perfect. And then we would say, okay, we visited me. Now we can visit my right child. Well, A doesn't have one. So we're all done with A. 
Now we can move back up to B. Have we finished um, visiting B's left child? Yes, we have. And so now we can visit B. Then we can visit the right child. And so we go visit C. And C has no children, so we keep going. Now we finish evaluating all of D's left child. And so we can visit D. And then finally, we visit the right child, E. And you're going to note in-order traversals are actually a little more um, specific than pre-order or post-order because this sort of only makes sense when you have a sort of symmetrical left child and right child, or in other words, when you're working with a binary tree where you only have two children. I guess there are ways to define it when you have more than two children, but um, that's just one thing to note is that these all work even if you have more than um, two children, but this one, not so much. Finally, we're going to talk about post-order traversals. And so again, here we visit the child nodes before visiting the parent nodes at all. And so we say this one can't visit until we have visited both of its direct children. So we can see this in order. First, we start here and we say, well, we haven't visited its children yet, so let's keep going. Then we start here, but we haven't visited both of the children yet, so we keep going. Then we're here and we go, uh, there are no children, so we can visit A. Then we come back up to C where we were because we just sort of went down and we're like coming back up around and we go, oh, we're not done visiting C yet because, or we can't say we visited C yet because we haven't evaluated both of the children because we visit the children nodes before visiting the parent nodes. So we'd sort of loop back around and go, okay, let me grab B. B has no children, so we're all done there. And now that we've evaluated both of C's children, we can finally come back and say, okay, see, you're all done. And so then we come back to where we were at E and we go, okay, how we finish evaluating all of E's children? We haven't. And so we go visit the right child. D has no children. And so we can visit it. And finally, now we have visited both of C's children, C and D. And so we're allowed to visit E. And so these are the three different traversals um, for depth first search. And so the important thing though, is that for depth first search, rather than prioritizing um, getting everything on the same level first, instead, like how BFS did, we were digging deeper in some way first. And so that is depth first search. And in contrast to um, breadth first search, which, which used that queue, DFS is usually done using a stack. And so that means the first thing in is the last thing out and things get pushed in um, and come out from the top. I will not be walking through all these examples with the stack, but you can sort of walk through it yourself and see that it works. Lastly, we're gonna talk about heaps. And so heaps are special trees that follow a few basic rules. One is that heaps are complete. The only empty parts of a heap are in the bottom row to the right. And so for example, this is not a valid heap because there are empty spots and they're in the bottom row, but they are not to the right. Instead, the empty spots are to the left here. On the other hand, this, where all the empty spots um, are to the right, they're not only in the bottom row. We should have filled out this row before we came moving over here. And so the one in the middle is our example of a valid heap. So for a min heap, each node must be smaller than all of its child nodes. And the opposite is true for max heaps. This picture below shows a min heap. And so here, zero is less than every other node in the tree. Zero is less than one, two, five, eight, seven. If we look at this um, subtree, we're gonna see that also five is less than its child nodes, seven and eight. And one is less than its child node two. And so that is the min heap property. For a max heap, it would just be the opposite, that the biggest number has to be on top. And that is heaps. And so for insertion into heaps, what we do is we put it at the next empty spot. So that means to the leftmost spot. For example, if our heap looked something like this, the next empty spot would be here, then the next empty spot would be here, then here. And then finally, once we finished filling this whole row, now we can make a new row. And this ensures that min heap property, or not the min heap property, sorry, the completeness property, that the only empty parts of the heap are in the bottom row to the right. And so that's how we choose which spot to put it in. But then here's the thing. 
So let's say in this um, example below, we've decided to insert one here because that was the correct next spot. But is everything okay here? No, we're violating our min heat property because negative one is less than one and less than zero, but it's below them. Or in other words, the smallest thing is not at the top. Zero should have all of its children be greater than it. And so our min heat property has been violated. The way we fix this after inserting negative one into the correct place is by bubbling it up. Or in other words, swapping places until we've reached um, a point where the min heat property is now um, protected, I guess. And so negative one and one would swap. And that brings us here. And then finally, negative one and zero would swap because negative one is still smaller. And now everything is okay. And the min heat property is good. So that's what insertion looks like. Deletion from heaps is a little different. What we do is basically we remove the bottom most rightmost node. And then we stick that value into the top. And so I want to emphasize that whenever we're deleting from a heap, we're always selecting, or in general, the reason people use heaps is because they want to get the smallest item in the whole thing. And so if someone says, remove min on this heap, they're expecting to get zero. And that's the whole point of using it. So we want to remove this top element. But if we remove that, it would be pretty complicated to just get rid of this and like shift things. So instead we just stick four up there, right? And so now four goes at the top and you're gonna notice that by simply removing this, we've maintained the completeness of our tree very simply. The only empty spots are in the bottom row to the right. If we had tried to remove zero, we would have had this very complicated pattern where we'd have to somehow fill things in and shift them to restore that min heapness. And so instead we do this simple way of, or sorry, to restore that completeness. And so now we've simply maintained the completeness by just moving um, this element up to the top. But here's the question. Now, is the min heap property maintained? No, it's not because four is not less than all of its children four is greater than one. And so this means now we have to swim things down. So four is going to swap with the smaller of its children, in this case, one, and now one is on top. Then again, are we done swimming down? Not quite. Four is still greater than its children or specifically the child too. And so we should swim four down with its smallest child which in this case is two because two is the only child. And so two and four swap. And now the result is that we have a min heap, which is both complete and obeys the min heap property that the smallest things are on top and every node is less than its children. And so that's deletion from a heap. Now we can move on to the worksheet. And so I'm going to actually link you to one of Anjali's videos from last semester. And she will go over problems one and three in one video and then problem two in a different video. And I'll give you links and timestamps in the description. Thanks for tuning in.